Good evening, everybody. My name is Danielle. I am from Promoter Cancer Center's Community Outreach and Education Department. Happy New Year. This is our first um, educational webinar of 2023. It's a important topic that we host every year. We're gonna talk about advances in breast cancer and updates from the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium that just happened in um, December. Um, our speakers are Drs. Freya Schnabel, Namit Gerber, Nina Diabreo, Sylvia Adams, and Nancy Chan. Um, all questions can be typed in the Q&A box that is along your information tab on the bottom of your screen. We will get to as many questions as time allows. Um, please mute yourself on your end so there's no background noise while uh, the presenters are presenting. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm going to pull up Dr. Schnabel's presentation and she's going to be our first speaker. Thank you, Danielle. You're welcome. I'm just gonna- Okay, thank you so much. So um, welcome everybody to our annual update from the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium that occurred in December of 2022. There's a lot of interesting information to go over tonight, so I'm gonna get started. The first topic I wanna talk about is genetic predisposition for breast cancer and breast cancer risk assessment. Next slide. So this presentation came from the Basser Center for BRCA at the University of Pennsylvania. And it's sought to clarify for us what the risks are for breast cancer that are related to not just BRCA1 and 2, but some of the less common uh, mutations that we can now identify on genetic testing. So as we now know, there is a group of genes um, here up at the top left that really are associated with an extremely high risk of breast cancer, BRCA1 and 2, another gene called PALB2, and then uh, the others that you can see listed in green. But there are uh, additional mutations that are associated with a somewhat lower risk for breast cancer that we would put in the moderate risk gene category, ATM, CHECK2, and so on. Um, and then there are much more controversial and lower risk genes that can also be identified. Next slide. So the presenters thought to give us a sense of where these genes are in terms of the hierarchy of risk and group them into high, moderate, and low risk genes. And again, that top box is very familiar to most of us. So is the moderate risk box. I know it looks a little bit like alphabet soup, but um, I think I wanna draw your attention to the lowest box on the slide, which is an indication that there are many genes that we can identify on the multi-gene panel testing that we now do that have nothing to do with an increased risk for breast cancer. So the moral of the story here is that all these genes are associated with different risks and we should not assume that every single genetic mutation is associated with a high risk for breast cancer. Next slide. Furthermore, um, we need to remember that some of these genes that we consider in the high risk box or the moderate risk box are also associated with increased risk for other diseases. And I'm particularly gonna draw your attention to the risk of pancreatic cancer that we can see is somewhat elevated, not only in BRCA1 and 2, but now is being recognized as elevated in uh, patients who have mutations in PALB2 and ATM. And these are important risks to know about. Now we do have good screening programs that help us um, identify those diseases at an early state. So uh, really, really important if you do genetic testing and find out that you have a mutation to understand what the specific risks are that are associated with the specific genetic mutation. Again, they are all different. Next slide. Important role for genetic counseling there. Um, the next presentation that I'm gonna talk about was from Dr. Katsopoulos from Toronto, where she uh, was talk gonna talk about hormonal exposure and breast cancer risk in BRCA1 and 2 carriers. And I'm just showing you this slide to show that most uh, people who carry these genetic mutations undergo screening for their breast cancer risk. Um, some of them undergo mastectomy, 
but very few undertake the risk-reducing medications of tamoxifen and raloxifene. Keep that in mind for a, a subsequent presentation we're going to talk about. Next slide, please. Um, we, it's very, very clear now that oral contraceptives and other contemporary contraceptive methods listed here on the table clearly reduce the risk of ovarian cancer in women who carry BRCA1 and 2 mutations. And that is super important because as we all know, there are no early detection methods for ovarian cancer in these high-risk patients. The data about contraceptives and breast cancer risk is um, a little bit less clear, but the majority of the studies do not show a significant increase in breast cancer risk associated with oral contraceptives. Next slide. This is um, another aspect, however, that I do want to emphasize, which is that for women who have BRCA1 and 2 mutations, especially at a young age, and then are put on some hormone replacement therapy, usually until they reach the average age at menopause, that strategy, which is great at reducing menopausal symptoms, does not appear to increase their breast cancer risk. So this is extremely reassuring information for us clinicians and for patients who are in that category. Next slide. Um, now, this was a, a terrific um, presentation on behalf of the Carriers Consortium, which is a, a consortium that um, has been interested in and has published a great deal of work about women at risk for breast cancer because of a variety of genetic mutations, not only BRCA1 and 2, but now as the audience is familiar, with additional genes that are associated with an increased risk for breast cancer. And specifically, this study looked to figure out, to help us identify the risk for women to develop cancer in their opposite breast when they've already had cancer in one breast and they have uh, these mutations. Next slide, please. And this, this is a large study. You can see large numbers of um, individuals both with breast cancer and without breast cancer and with these mutations. So this is helpful information based on a large population study. Next slide, please. So clearly we understand these are high risk patients and the patients were followed very carefully within this study um, and their genetic testing results were confirmed using a specific panel done by the study. Next slide, please. So what did they find? So um, first of all, the study included over 15,000 women. Um, most of them you can see were postmenopausal. Most of their breast cancers were um, hormone sensitive and of ductal nature. And at, uh, approximately half of these patients did take some kind of hormonal therapy when their uh, breast cancers were diagnosed. Next slide. So in terms of their risk to develop cancer in the opposite breast, um, this is what the, the data seem to show um, in terms of the risk associated with these various genes. You can see that the risks are highest in BRCA1 and 2 carriers um, and are lower with these other genes. Next slide, please. So to give that a little bit more detail, women who have BRCA1 and 2 mutations are at very significant risk to develop cancer in their opposite breast in the coming years. You can see the big separation of these two curves. Next slide. But when we start talking about some of the other mutations, you can see that the curves are not as far apart. Particularly for ATM, it's almost the same risk. And even for this uh, other mutated gene called CHECK2, while there is definitely um, an increase in risk, it's not as dramatic as what's seen with BRCA1 and 2. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Now, um, with the PALB2 gene, it appears that women whose first breast cancers are not hormone sensitive are at a higher risk to develop cancer in their opposite breast, but women whose first cancers are hormone sensitive do not have that same level of risk. Next slide, please. Um, and also, women who are older when their first cancers are diagnosed seem to have um, a lower risk of developing cancer in the opposite breast over time. Next slide. So why are, we, why are we going through all of this big exercise to understand the risk? Because it can inform surgical decision-making. Um, women who have BRCA1 and 2 mutations 
when they develop cancer in one breast and know that they are at increased risk for cancer in the other breast, will frequently undergo prophylactic mastectomies of the other breast. But as we can see from this data, women with other kinds of genetic mutations are not at the same level of risk to the other breast. And therefore, the benefit of doing these prophylactic mastectomies on the unaffected breast may be very different and not as compelling um, to uh, recommend the prophylactic mastectomy in the other breast. So once again, the theme here is that risks are different for different genetic mutations. We should not treat everyone as if they are at BRCA level risk. Next slide, please. So uh, talking about breast cancer prevention now, um, I wanna talk to you about a really great study um, that was long-term results, this is 10-year results, of a trial of using low-dose tamoxifen to prevent additional breast cancer in women with non-invasive disease. Next slide, please. Now, this uh, strategy of using very low dose of tamoxifen, we like to call it baby TAM. Um, and in this study, women over 75 who had high-risk uh, conditions like atypical ductal hyperplasia, LCIS, and even non-invasive intraductal carcinoma were enrolled. And this was a randomized trial to receive either tamoxifen or placebo. And the dose of tamoxifen in the trial was five milligrams a day versus the standard 20 milligrams a day that's done for women who receive this for breast cancer treatment. Uh, women received three years of treatment and they were followed for at least five years. And then the outcomes were measured. Next slide. So the initial presentation in 2018 at San Antonio seemed to show a benefit of the baby TAM strategy with fewer events of uh, developing cancer in the same breast or in the opposite breast. So this looked pretty promising. Next slide. But now we're looking at the data in a much longer term and following people way after they've finished the treatment. And as you can see from the slide, the risk of developing breast cancer is still significantly lower in the women who took this low-dose tamoxifen treatment. Next slide. And this has to do with the uh, effect of cancer, of uh, new cancers developing in the same breast and in the opposite breast. And you continue to see the benefit of this low-dose tamoxifen strategy. Next slide. And when they specifically looked at women who entered the trial because they had introductal carcinoma as a separate group, the benefit of the Low-dose tamoxifen seems very, very clear. Next slide. Now, what the other interesting facet here is that when we look at side effects and adverse effects, the nice um, outcome here is that the risk of some of these events is the same in the tamoxifen group and in the placebo group, meaning that this baby TAM strategy, again, reduced the risk of adverse events in the participants. Next slide. So. To summarize, this low-dose tamoxifen strategy lowered the recurrence in women with non-invasive breast cancer and high-risk lesions at 10 years of follow-up without increased side effects. Um, and I think that this rep now represents a really interesting option, especially for women who do not tolerate the drug at full dose. Next slide, please. So being a surgeon here, I'm going to talk about surgery next. You've been waiting for this part. Um, so this was a terrific um, trial that was uh, presented by Dr. Judy, Judy Bowie, and this is done by one of the uh, large national groups. And this was a trial to evaluate the feasibility of doing breast conserving surgery in women who have multiple primary cancers in the same breast. And, and this is a group of patients for whom there's been a lot of trepidation about offering lumpectomy surgery when the cancer appears to be uh, present in multiple areas at the same time. So we can see that uh, the study included women over 40 with two or three areas of breast cancer, at least one of them invasive, and at least two centimeters between the areas. Um, they did exclude women who had more than two quadrants involved, um, and they also excluded women who were BRCA carriers and who had more extensive uh, advanced disease. Next slide. All the women in the trial had lumpectomies. They had nodal staging as is standard with whole breast radiation to follow. 
and treatment of the lymph node area depended on the discretion of the patient of the physician and the patient's situation. Again, the adjuvant use of chemotherapy and uh, endocrine therapy was uh, predicated on the patient's disease, and the, de uh, the design of the study looked at the recurrence of breast cancer in the same breast, and they predetermined an acceptable local recurrence risk at about less than 8%. This trial included 270 patients. Next slide. So let's look at the results now. So in this trial, the estimated risk of local recurrence at five years was 3.1%, which is well below the predetermined cutoff um, that the uh, people who designed the trial um, said at the, at the uh, outset. Uh, six contralateral cancers developed, so cancer in the opposite breast, and three non-breast primary cancers developed in women in the study. There were four patients in the trial who did go on to develop metastatic disease, and there was one breast cancer-related death, but very important, none of the patients who developed distant disease had also developed recurrence within the breast. Next slide. So um, just to, to get a little more granular on the detail here, I'll point out that this was a rigorous trial from the perspective of surgery, and patients were required to have uh, margins of uh, greater than two millimeters when the lumpectomies were done around the cancer. So they really tried to make sure that there was a good surgical result here. Most patients had uh, two areas of breast cancer. Next slide, please. And um, in addition, it did appear that when patients had preoperative MRI that we really think are so important for surgical planning, uh, the MRI appeared to be very beneficial in helping to reduce the risk for recurrence in the breast. And I feel that this is really just about having a better sense of the volume of tissue that needed to be resected for successful lumpectomy surgery. Next slide, please. Endocrine therapy uh, was also clearly beneficial in reducing the risk of recurrence in the breast, and that goes along with what we know about endocrine therapy in general. Next slide. So in conclusion, um, what the trial uh, was able to demonstrate is that women who have multiple cancers in the same breast who undergo breast conserving surgery with good margins and uh, good radiation therapy have a low risk of recurrence in the breast with five years of follow-up. Uh, MRI evaluation and endocrine therapy after surgery uh, impacted positively and reduced the risk of local recurrence. Um, but we have to recognize the fact that this was a very particular study group with postmenopausal women with basically good prognosis disease. Um, and as a result, further uh, study will be needed to determine if these results will be generalizable to the population of women with other forms of breast cancer. Next slide, please. Please. So the last, um, the last study that I'm going to talk about today is uh, called the positive trial. And you may have heard about this because this did make somewhat of a splash within the media. Next slide. And, and this was um, a large trial uh, done in multiple institutions to determine if it is safe for patients with hormone-sensitive breast cancer to interrupt hormonal therapy to attempt a pregnancy. The trial enrolled premenopausal women under 42 who desired a pregnancy and had no evidence of disease at entry to the trial. They were eligible if they had already had 18 to 30 months of hormonal therapy for stage one to three hormone sensitive breast cancer, and they could have had prior neoadjuvant chemotherapy and fertility preservation techniques. Next slide, please. So this is just a schematic that shows you the design of the trial, the patients were given up to two years to attempt pregnancy, conceive, deliver, and breastfeed. And if there was no pregnancy by one year, they were strongly encouraged to consider assisted reproductive techniques. The patients were again strongly uh, recommended to resume treatment after uh, the pregnancies and long-term follow-up is planned. Primary endpoint for the study was the breast cancer free interval. So that was from the time of enrollment measured to the first uh, event of recurrence either in the same breast, in the local lymph node area, 
or the opposite breast or uh, recurrence elsewhere in the body. Next slide. So looking at the patient character, uh, looking at the um, at just the study design, they attempted to design this in a way to keep everybody safe. So they decided ahead of time that under 46 um, events for breast cancer free interval would be considered safe. And they compared the results of the patients in the trial to previously um, trial, trials that were previously done for premenopausal women with breast cancer. Next slide. And here's our schema. And this was done in North America, Europe, and uh, Asia and the Pacific. The um, total number of patients for the uh, analysis uh, were around 500, and um, the median follow-up was about 41 months, so under four years. Next slide, please. Now, um, the patients were appropriately young. Uh, the vast majority of them were under 40, um, and 75% of them had not had any prior pregnancies, so obviously highly motivated. The uh, study group also skewed much uh, towards patients with early stage disease. Next slide. As you can also see here, um, the patients had received endocrine therapy sometimes with ovarian suppression, without ovarian suppression. 62% um, had had chemotherapy prior to surgery. And, uh, and you can see the distribution, 45% had mastectomies and 55% had breast conserving surgeries. So next slide. Now looking at some of the outcomes here. So you can see at the follow-up time, which is relatively short that we present here, the breast cancer free intervals seem pretty close together. Um, there were 44 events in the group of patients on the trial. So we'll remember that number in a minute. And, and for the uh, distance disease free survivals, you can see again, the curves are pretty close, but there does seem to be a little bit of a divergence. Next slide. Now, um, when we look at the patients who were, uh, obviously all the patients were recommended to resume the endocrine therapy, it's really important to note that not all of them did so. So about 76% did resume their hormonal therapy, but that means almost a quarter did not. And 8% um, had significant events before they took, uh, got back to taking their hormonal therapy, which is a little bit of a caution. Next slide. Now, the conclusions of the study are fairly narrow. So the study uh, authors concluded that the temporary interruption of hormonal therapy to attempt pregnancy um, in this population of women did not seem to impact on the short-term outcomes. And 74% of the patients had at least one pregnancy within two years. They did not see a significant issue with birth defects. Um, and of course, they're going to continue to monitor the patient population. And longer term data is certainly important to clarify the uh, appropriateness of this strategy. Next slide. But uh, you know, a few questions certainly remain. One of them, is that the uh, rate of events that they saw within the trial very closely approached what they had considered to be a safety signal. There were 44 events where their cutoff had been 46 for safety, so a little bit of a caution. The number of patients who had recurrences or uh, death before resuming therapy is, again, significant and something to think about. And as those uh, curves continue to be followed over time, there is some sense that they may be diverging. And so longer term follow-up is certainly necessary. So I'm gonna wrap up with a summary of the, um, of the talks that I just spoke about. Clearly different genetic mutations have different risk profiles and people should be managed according to their specific mutation when they are higher risk. Contraceptives lower the risk for ovarian cancer in BRCA1 and 2 carriers. Hormone replacement therapy after risk-reducing um, ovarian surgery does appear to be safe. Next slide. The, um, the risk of developing cancer in the opposite breast after uh, cancer in one breast is highest in BRCA1 and 2 carriers and has different levels with other mutations. I do believe that it is time to utilize low-dose tamoxifen. Um, I think the data is very compelling. Um, certainly appropriately selected patients with multiple cancers 
may be eligible for breast conserving surgery, and we shouldn't just um, recommend mastectomy for all of these patients without further consideration. And my last slide, um, the results of the positive trial were important because it is certainly important to study this area, but further follow-up is necessary to clarify the safety uh, for women who are considering um, interrupting endocrine therapy and pregnancy after breast cancer diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schnabel. I do see a couple of questions in the Q&A chat box. Okay. Freya, can so, you see those? Um, I, can see, I can see the questions. So um, um, the participants want to know about access to the recording or just the slides. Can you address that, uh, Danielle? Um, we will definitely have access to the recordings and the slides as well with the um, presenter's permission. Okay. Um, one of the attendees asked if in the positive trial there was any difference between women who became pregnant naturally versus those who required IVF. Um, I can't answer the question at this time. That's going to require some subgroup analysis. So we're waiting for a little bit more data. These presentations are relatively brief. And we're also going to look forward to um, the full uh, publication of the papers from these trials, which will give us more information. And um, I think someone else asked about a trial that looks at pregnancy risk after the end of hormonal therapy. And, and we can say that there is emerging information that uh, supports the idea that uh, pregnancy after breast cancer treatment is something that does not increase the uh, patient's risk of uh, adverse events. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over the screen and the presentation to Dr. Gerber. Dr. Gerber, I could see your presentation. If you Wonderful. want to put it. Thank you. Do I need to swap to the other view or is the view appropriate? Um, no, I think you should put it in um, presentation mode. How's that? Perfect. Okay, wonderful. Hi, everyone. Um, it's so nice to look over the names and see so many names I recognize from so many different, um, um, you know, backgrounds and, and medical backgrounds and levels of expertise. And it's really nice to get to talk to all of you tonight. Um, tonight, I'm going to be talking about two abstracts from San Antonio, actually three abstracts from San Antonio. Um, here are my disclosures. I have research funding from Prelude uh, that directly relates to the content of the first abstract that I'm discussing. Um, so the three abstracts that I want to talk about, uh, all of which were presented at San Antonio this year, the first is the polar abstract, which looks at de-escalation of radiation in early stage uh, invasive breast cancer patients. Um, the second one will look at both fractionation and protons for delivering post-mastectomy radiation. And then the third um, is research um, that came from NYU um, on telemedicine and clinical trial enrollment. Um, one note I want to say about the first two abstracts um, is that while the science is really exciting, and these were both oral presentations at San Antonio, um, neither one is quite ready for prime time yet, and I'll go into why, but certainly, you know, uh, just to sort of see my slides in that context, and I'll try to give a little background about where these studies are coming from and where we're going with them. Um, so this is um, the EBCTCG meta-analysis published in 2011 that shows that in all women who have breast conserving surgery, meaning that they have a lumpectomy as opposed to a full mastectomy, the addition of radiation lowers the risk of any first recurrence from 35% to about 20%. And that translates into a benefit in breast cancer mortality at 15 years and into a reduction in the risk of death from any cause at 15 years. And this meta-analysis was really practice changing because it shows that the benefit of radiation in lowering the risk of cancer coming back in the breast actually translates into a survival benefit. And over the past um, you know, decade, since this meta-analysis came out, there have been multiple studies looking at, um, is there a subpopulation of patients? Is there a group of women who don't need radiation, right? So for all women, we know that radiation is gonna lower the risk of recurrence, but are there maybe patients who don't need any radiation? Um, so NSAB B21 was a seminal trial that tried to use size to select low-risk women who might not need radiation. So they took patients with tumors under one centimeter, lymph node negative, 
But what you can see from these curves in this upper right corner is that radiation lowered the risk despite the small size of the tumors. Um, and that's, you know, ones with tamoxifen and ones with placebo, but uh, both of these curves have radiation and significantly lower the risk. Uh, another strategy that's been done is to look at whether age can be used to select women who might not need radiation. So this was the CALGB trial where all the patients were over the age of 70. And what you can see is that thankfully, the risk of recurrence is quite low without radiation here in yellow, um, but you still see this benefit um, of reduction um, in, in recurrence in blue, which is radiation plus the tamoxifen as opposed to tamoxifen alone. So even in these older women uh, who have a low risk of recurrence, even without the radiation, the radiation is still lowering the risk of recurrence. And now comes sort of our modern crop of trials, which is in addition to using age or size, also looking at biology. So this is the Lumina trial, which was presented at ASCO uh, just a few months ago in June of 2022. And they selected women both based on age, age greater than 55, um, grade one to two, small centimeters, and they had to be luminal A. This is where biology came in. Estrogen receptor positive, progesterone receptor positive, HER2 negative, and the proliferation index had to be less than 13.25%. And their outcomes were that they had a 2.3% recurrence at five years, which is very low, thankfully. Um, and so this trial is perhaps showing that maybe we have some way to select women using biology and clinical factors. Now, this is a single arm trial, so we don't have a comparison arm with radiation. And now comes the, the new abstract presented at San Antonio, which is looking at a gene signature called the polar signature to try to select these women who might not need radiation. Uh, in order to develop the signature, uh, the authors uh, used this trial uh, from Sweden, which accrued in 1991 to 1997. This is the original trial results where they showed that women were randomized to radiation or no radiation. And in all comers, just like the meta-analysis I showed, radiation reduced the risk of recurrence from 14% to 4% at five years. They divided their subset of women into a training cohort and a validation cohort in order to come up with and test this gene signature. And they performed gene set enrichment analysis on the patients in the training cohort. Now this data had previously been published before San Antonio. Here's the genes. And interestingly, these are genes involved in immune response and proliferation. What's new about this um, abstract is that they validate this signature in three clinical trials. The original Swedish BCG91RT, that's their, they now have their validation set that they set aside, a Princess Margaret trial and a Scottish trial. And these trials are all a little different in terms of the systemic therapy and who they include, but they're all early stage breast cancer, estrogen receptor positive, randomized to radiation and no radiation. And this is just showing some of the characteristics of the patients, so, you know, um, a distribution of age, um, a distribution of luminal A versus luminal B. Um, systemic therapy was very different. In Princess Margaret, 100% got endocrine therapy, whereas um, in the Swedish trial, 0% got endocrine therapy. Um, and again, the patients were randomized to radiation versus no radiation. And this is the main finding. This is the slide that sort of shows their results. So in those patients who had this low polar score, again, this is a gene signature that they're performing on the tumor, um, and of course, for these older trials, they're extracting um, RNA from stored tumor blocks, right? These patients were treated um, decades ago. Those patients had a low gene signature. There was no difference between radiation and no radiation. So it's not just that the recurrence is low and the curves still diverge. The curves here do not diverge. They're overlapping. The p-value is 0.832, not significant. In polar high patients, conversely, you see this big benefit of radiation with a hazard ratio of 0.37. Okay, so women who get radiation are 37% less likely to have their breast cancer come back. Um, and when they look at the polar gene in um, analysis with other confounding factors, like the patient age, the tumor size, the grade, it remains significant on multivariable analysis. Um, other factors that come out, older age has a lower risk of recurrence. Um, interestingly, size does not come out, grade does not come out, and molecular groupings do not come out independent of the polar score. And the other thing that's really important about the signature is that um, it's not just per prognostic, meaning it doesn't just predict who's going to have their breast cancer come back. It also is predictive of whether you're going to benefit from radiation. So if you're in this low area, 
there's no difference between radiation and no radiation. If you're in the high area, there's a big difference. You see these curves diverge, and that's shown statistically in this table. Um, so this um, polar score is an effective uh, genomic score to identify women who are going to benefit from radiation. Um, the reason this is not ready for prime time is in part just that this test is not commercially available right now um, in the United States to our patients. Um, but it definitely sort of as an academic intellectual, um, um, you know, uh, abstract where this is very exciting to have this, this gene signature. We do have a lot of ongoing trials of omission of radiation. I already talked about the Lumina trial. Here at NYU, we have the DEBRA trial open. Um, this is using Oncotype, which is another gene signature which is commercially available uh, to select women who are eligible for omission of radiation. Uh, patients who are um, over the age of 50 and below the age of 70 can be, and an Oncotype less than 18, can be randomized to radiation or no radiation. Um, and we are currently accruing to this trial, and it's a very exciting trial, also incorporating a genomic signature into the decision for radiation. Okay, so I'm going to shift to the second abstract. Uh, this is an abstract that is looking at giving post mastectomy radiation with proton therapy. The rationale for proton therapy um, is that it has the potential to lower the risk of cardiac dose and therefore major coronary events. Um, this is just showing dosimetrically. This is with photons, which is the usual uh, form of radiation with a 3D technique. This is with IMRT, which is another form of photon-based radiation. And this is protons. You can see protons potentially have the ability to help spare the heart and the lungs more. Now, what this slide doesn't show is that if you use photons with this deep inspiration breath hold that we use a lot at NYU, you're actually able to also spare the heart and lungs. Um, so while protons have some advantages, there are also ways to accomplish a lot of these dosimetric uh, advantages with photons with the IBH. But this, this paper was looking at protons, and they were also looking at changing our usual dosing. So the usual dosing after a mastectomy is 25 treatments. Um, this trial, in addition to using protons, also used 15 to 16 treatments uh, of protons. And there's some data in women without reconstruction, but we really have very little data in women with reconstruction. We have this large RT charm trial uh, where we're expected to have results in late 2023, and that's with photons. So this trial took women who needed PMRT, randomized them to conventional fractionation or hypofractionation, all with protons. Hypofractionation is the shorter uh, regimen, so it's three weeks instead of the usual five weeks. Um, they had 88 patients who were randomized. Um, and what they showed is that um, in the conventional arm, five patients had unplanned surgical intervention for contracture. One patient had an infectious complication, and eight patients had infectious complications with hypofractionation. They did not meet their primary endpoint of saying that this is non-inferior um, because the upper bound of this confidence interval exceeded 10%. So they could not say that protons are non-inferior to photons. Um, and the only thing that came out on their analysis was that immediate breast reconstruction was significantly associated with complications and a median follow-up of 39 months. And this is just showing a little bit more about the infections. Um, their recurrences were thankfully uh, pretty low, mainly distant recurrences, actually only distant recurrences. And so their conclusions was that the proton therapy provided excellent local regional control with no significant difference in overall complication rates, but they could not establish that the shorter regimen was not inferior to the longer regimen, maybe because their sample size was so small. And we await this RT charm trial. Um, I am highlighting one other ongoing trial specifically. So RT charm is looking at shorter treatment versus longer treatment with photons. That's the form of radiation we use typically. Um, there is this rad comp study, uh, which is comparing protons to photons. So it's not changing the number of treatments. It's only changing the modality. Um, and that trial um, is primary outcome is looking at major cardiovascular events. Um, and they've currently accrued 91% of their patients. So we're really excited to see the results of this trial. Um, as it comes out, they have an estimated 12 to 24 months remaining to complete enrollment. And this will give us some better sense of whether there is an advantage of protons over photons, which as of right now, we really do not know, and we have no evidence for. And then finally, just to touch on some research from our own group, um, we looked at patients who had um, an initial consultation, either in person or virtually, um, from the period of 2020 to 2021. This was a time where because of COVID, we were offering all our patients telemedicine and in-person visits. 
Um, and we wanted to see where there are differences between uh, both, you know, who was getting telemedicine, choosing to get telemedicine versus in person, and also was it affecting our ability to put patients on clinical trials, which is a major way that we advance our care for patients with breast cancer. Um, so we had 476 patients uh, with 259 office visits and 217 telemedicine visits. When we then looked at the differences between what predicted for who got telemedicine and who got in person, older age, unemployment, and chemotherapy receipt were associated with decreased usage of telemedicine. So older patients were less likely to use telemedicine. Unemployed patients were less likely to use telemedicine. Those who had chemotherapy were less likely to use telemedicine. And then patients who received radiation in our institution um, were less likely uh, to use telemedicine uh, versus um, in person. We did not see um, any difference in telemedicine usage based on disease, stage, or by radiation treatment recommended. 10% of the patients we saw were eligible to enroll on clinical trials. 76% um, of those patients enrolled, which is really incredible and a testament to our patients for uh, being so willing to help us advance our care uh, through clinical trials. And of our 259 patients who underwent office visit, 14% were eligible to enroll on the trial and 53% enrolled. And this was not a statistically significant difference. So we did not see any difference in clinical trial enrollment between telemedicine and office visits, which was very reassuring for us as we continue to offer telemedicine, which we find is a great benefit to our patients. And we're very happy to see that it is not tampering our ability to offer patients and to get patients enrolled on clinical trials. Um, so just to conclude, to sum up, uh, we have these emerging gene signatures, which are really uh, exciting and are prognostic and predictive of radiation benefit in early stage breast cancer. There is now emerging data for hypofractionation in women with reconstruction requiring post-infected radiation. That was a small proton trial. We're really awaiting the RT-CHARM trial for, to look at this question of shorter treatment. And we're awaiting the PCORI proton trial to look at this question of protons versus photons. And we do not see any difference in clinical trial enrollment between telemedicine and in-person consults. So thank you all so much for your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Gerber. Um, if you want to go into the Q&A box, can you see that? <clears throat> Okay, so I see this question. Do all surgeons send tissue in for oncotype scores after lumpectomies if someone is ER positive? Uh, my oncotype score determined I need chemo by a friend who had similar stage size tumor, no node involvement, nothing was sent in oncotype. Yeah, so you're bringing up a great point. There is variability in you know, who sends the oncotype, when they send the oncotype. This also varies by institution. Um, you know, generally for very small tumors under five millimeters, we don't necessarily recommend oncotype because the benefit of chemotherapy in those tumors, um, you know, is not necessarily um, there regardless of oncotype. And similarly, there are some patients for whom chemotherapy is indicated regardless of oncotype. So this is a very individualized situation, and it's you know, and and, it, and even within sort of the the oncologic variations in, in who needs an oncotype, there are also institution variations. So you bring up a really important point. Great. I am going to hand over the screen and the presentation to Dr. DeBreo. Can you, are you gonna share yours? Yes, I'm gonna share my screen, so thank you. Um, just let me know if you see it and I'll move into presenter mode. I hope I you can. can. Yes. Okay, great. Let's see if I can start at the very beginning. Um, so we're going to quickly move on into um, talking about some of the medical oncology updates. And um, I I've been tasked with talking about the updates in our HER2 positive space. So the um, I have no disclosures. Um, just to quickly recap, you know, the HER2 gene, uh, the HER2 protein is, as we know, um, and most of you know, is that the HER2 receptor uh, is encoded by the HER2 gene or the ERBB2 gene, which is a, a tumor, a proto-oncogene, uh, which is located at the long arm of the human chromosome 17, 17Q21. And if there is overexpression of this protein because of an amplification or more copies of this gene, that can lead to HER2 positive breast cancer. It's found in approximately 20 to 25% of patients with breast cancer. So how do we test for HER2? And I think that's sort of the foundation of a lot of the talks today. So I'm gonna just spend a little time on this. Uh, the first way we check for HER2 is something called IHC, where we stain the actual tumor cell uh, for the actual receptor. We have an antibody that stains that 
which is tag, and the pathologist uh, uses the stain, and they're able to sort of stain the cells just that have this overexpression of HER2. So based on the amount of expression, you can divide uh, the expression into 0, 1 plus, 2 plus, and 3 plus. And uh, until 2022, uh, you know, we knew that patients who had three plus were positive and that hasn't changed. We knew that patients who had one plus or zero were called HER2 negative. Um, and th that has started to change a little bit as we'll talk about. And those who had a two plus were called equivocal and required another test called FISH in order to clarify whether they were truly positive or negative. However, as we'll see in these later presentations, the, the group that is one plus and two plus is now being defined as HER2 low and there are certain treatment implications for these patients. So what is FISH? Uh, FISH actually goes and looks at the gene copy within the cell rather than on the surface of the cell. And so if there were more gene copies, and to make it simple, you know, it's a red and green here. If you have um, the HER2 gene amplified of the ratio of the red signals to the green, which is the centromere, is greater than two, or if the copy number is greater than six, then those were considered positive uh, for HER2. Um, there are more nuances, and I, uh, with it, you know, pathologists spend a lot of time getting this right. But what we know is that based on what the actual number, is it two, is it four copies, uh, we can actually further subdivide into group one, two, three, and four. And the really truly negative uh, group is the group that has less, a ratio of less than two and a copy number less than four. So um, these, um, these um, um, sort of nuances are really important when it comes to treating patients, because as we know, a lot of the HER2 driven therapies are really just approved for patients with HER2 positive, either by IHC or by FISH. So how do we target the HER2 receptor? The HER2 receptor has two parts, and it, there's an extracellular component and an intracellular component. So it sort of transects the cell membrane. Uh, the HER2 antibodies are familiar to you, trastuzumab or Herceptin, pertuzumab, pergetter, and another drug called margituximab, which is less familiar, uh, but also uh, available. These drugs target the outside. They actually target different domains of the receptor on the outside of the cell. Um, then comes this big class that we'll spend a little time on, the antibody drug conjugates, which really was the, the big news in medical oncology in 2022. Uh, there are uh, several of them, TDM1, Ketsyla, uh, uh, on HER2 or TDXT, which again uh, is the star of 2022, and, and a few others. And then there are other drugs that target the HER2 receptor below the cell surface. These are generally oral medications, what we call small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And some of these are maybe familiar, lapatinib, neratinib, another a blockbuster drug called ticatinib, which is the new kid on the block, and another drug called pyrotinib. And all of them have varying um, properties, but the bottom line is they all target the receptor below the cell surface membrane. So it's essentially a, 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 a drug that targets the top of the receptor and a drug that can target downstream. So what are the challenges in her to positive breast cancer? So that I'll address in today's talk. Uh, some of the abstracts that were presented were really pertinent to what we still see as a challenge. We know that HER2 positive breast cancer stage for stage is more aggressive than HER2 negative cancers. Um, and certainly we know that patients with metastatic HER2 breast cancer, uh, when they present with metastatic cancer, about 30 to 50% will develop brain metastases. Unfortunately, HER2 cancer has a propensity to go into the brain. And so even if you have wonderful responses in, this, in the body, sometimes we do see brain mets develop. And a lot of, some of that is because the antibodies, the Herceptin and the Pertuzumab, have not really penetrated the, brain bar uh, the blood brain barrier effectively. But that's just, just maybe one of the reasons why these drugs uh, don't, uh, these uh, cancers don't always respond in the brain. And the other reason maybe that these brain mets may actually be a little different from the primary tumor when they traverse into the brain. Traditionally, we've used radiation because that's the one therapy that can target the, the brain better than anything else. Uh, in the early stage HER2 cancer, um, there's, we have the opposite problem. We, you know, we also know that because the HER2 receptor is really the driver of cancer, is it really required that we use multiple chemotherapy drugs? Can, can't we just use some of these newer drugs or these antibodies? And so minimizing chemotherapy without losing efficacy and predicting who those patients are who can do with less rather than more has always been the challenge. So right now, uh, and this is the slide that I, I think uh, I'm gonna refer to at the end, where we were in 2022, uh, the frontline ther therapy for um, HER2 positive uh, metastatic breast cancer was based on something called the Cleopatra trial. And that still remains a standard of care in January, 2023. Uh, it's a combination of chemotherapy, a taxane chemo, along with Herceptin and Pajetta. And it's very hard to beat these numbers. The overall survival was uh, close to five years. 
uh, even after eight years, 37% of the patients who, have, who were on this trial are still alive uh, and are doing well. So that, that is a, a big testament to how great this combination is. The second line, uh, once patients unfortunately progress on this, was based on a trial called the Amelia trial, which got us approval of a drug called TDM1 or Ketsyla, or the first of the antibody drug conjugates. Uh, here, the overall survival was about 30 months. And now, as I think everybody in the news is aware, we have a, a new, some new kids on the block. Uh, we have TDXD or, or, or HER2, uh, well known not only in the HER2 space, but also in the HER2 low, based on the so called Destiny suite of trials, the Destiny 03, which was the on HER2 or TDXD versus the TDM1, and O2, which was TDXD after TDM1. Not far behind was a drug, the tocatinib that I mentioned, that also made the news as because of its activity in patients who had untreated brain metastases. This was a combination called tocatinib, uh, capecitabine, and trastuzumab, or the HER2 climb regimen. And these patients had also progressed after TDM1. So where we were at the end of 2002, we were kind of uh, sequencing these regimens. But as you'll see, that has changed dramatically. So what are these antibody drug conjugates? So these antibody drug conjugates, uh, which we'll be talking a lot about, are really a combination of the antibody, in this case, Herceptin, combined to a very low dose chemotherapy uh, with a linker that attaches it. And the idea is that the, the, if the antibody is binding straight to the receptor, the chemotherapy will be delivered straight to the cell and there'll be less collateral damage. So almost like a warhead or a torpedo. Um, so that's the traditional mechanism, and that sums intuitively is the best way that these recept these drugs work. Uh, it goes straight and hones in on that receptor. But there's also a second mechanism, and that's, that's important as we talk about HER2 low cells, because the HER2 antibody, um, it certainly localizes that drug and it goes into the cell. But the drug or the, the chemotherapy that's bound to the drug or so-called payload of, that of the um, ADC uh, can be released and diffused back out and also kill other cells. And that's what we call the bystander killing effect. And so it's a dual purpose. It's not just killing HER2 positive cells that are uh, targeted by the drug, but they also may be some effect on other cells. Uh, and that becomes important as we go along um, talking about other uh, uses of these ADCs. The extent of this bystander effect depends upon how much chemotherapy, how much payload is bound to that antibody or what we call the drug to antibody ratio. Um, so the two big antibodies that are or ADCs, antibody drug conjugates in the market, are TDM1 and TDXD. Um, there are some differences. The payload is different in the case of TDM1, it's emtansine, and in, uh, in the case of TDXD, it's uh, deruxtecan. But the big difference is the drug to antibody ratio. It's 3.6 with TDM1, and it's a 7.9. So there's a higher drug to antibody ratio. The linker, the, the link that links the antibody to the drug uh, is slightly different. This is a cleavable linker, um, so much more um, robust and, and allows the cell to the, the drug to stay in the cell and to diffuse out slowly. The this is a non-cleavable linker. There's also some difference in the uh, side effects based on the properties of these cells. So that's just to show you that there are differences between these antibodies. So I'm moving very quickly to the first of the Destiny's trials that was updated at the San Antonio. We've already seen wonderful results from this trial. Uh, this was a trial that looked at patients who had metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer and had already been treated with TDM1, which was the second line therapy of choice at the time. Um, and they were, they were randomized to either getting TDXD or physician's choice of treatment, which was could be any other combination with one of the oral drugs or with, um, or with chemotherapy. Uh, what is important is these patients had to have at least two prior therapies, including the TDM1, but there were patients who had up to five different types of treatment before they went on this trial. So this was a fairly heavily pretreated population. While the study did not include patients with active brain mets, if there was patients who had brain mets that had had radiation before or who were stable, they were included. There were about 74 patients on the TDXD arm and 36 on the other arm. And as you can see, which I've highlighted in red here, there was a 64% reduction. I mean, there's a really big separation of those two curves uh, in the risk of progression uh, in patients who had the TDXD. This was updated at San Antonio, and it continues to hold 17.8 months versus 6.9 months. And more importantly, patients are living longer, 39.2 months versus 26.5 months. 
Uh, the other important thing was that when patients who had the brain mess, there was an improvement in progression-free survival of 13.9 months versus 5.6 months. Again, very big news for our patients who were often excluded from, you know, from trials that uh, uh, used these other drugs in the past. Then came Destiny 03, which was playing upon this wonderful idea that we had a new drug that was a game changer. And in this case, um, it was actually pitted against TDM1, which was the second line at the time. So these patients were uh, did have to have prior Cleopatra, which was the taxane combination we talked about, um, or they had to progress very quickly after receiving uh, treatment for the early stage HER2 cancer. Again, they were allowed to receive up to two lines of treatment, but even patients up to five were included and also included some patients with stable brain meds. So this was really a comparison of the TDXT versus the TDM1. Once again, a 77% reduction in the risk of progression uh, versus TDM1. Uh, numbers like this cannot be, you know, uh, cannot be beat. The updated progression-free survival, as you saw, was 28.2 versus 6.8. And the overall survival has actually not been reached yet. It's, it's right now in the uh, upwards of three plus years. And, and of course, we'll be seeing more updates as we, as we go along. So one other thing that became really uh, evident is that it didn't matter what subgroup you were, whether you had hormone positive or hormone negative cancers, uh, whether you had baseline um, METs or not, whether you had prior treatment or not, everybody seemed to benefit from the TDXD better than the TDM1. The other thing uh, we talked about was the brain mets. And again, on, on DB03, there was a 63.9% response, including some patients, 10, 10 of whom had a complete response where no cancer was evident in the brain. So this became a really important uh, part of our arsenal for treatment of patients who had HER2 disease that uh, did spread to the brain. So moving on, the most important thing though, how safe is it? I think this is another uh, piece of the puzzle that needs to be solved because while we have this great drug, there were some toxicities that were un uncommon in patients who were just getting Herceptin or TDM1. One of the big ones is actually nausea. Uh, there is much more nausea with this drug than it is than there was with, uh, with other types of drugs, uh, especially on DespiO2 and certainly with TDM1. Uh, we do see some more alopecia or hair loss, more fatigue, more diarrhea. So we are seeing more of these other side effects that we traditionally associated with chemotherapy, though not as, uh, as much as uh, straight up chemotherapy. More importantly, though, the one that really stood out was something called interstitial lung disease. And this is, again, a new phenomenon. It's, uh, it's seen with certain, very rarely with Herceptin-based uh, drugs, but with uh, TDXD, the interstitial lung disease was really an, uh, an adverse effect that came to the forefront, unfortunately, because there were actually two deaths on the original trial uh, in patients who were received the TDXD. So while there was a, there was a wonderful drug, we knew that there were some deaths and this, this needed to be looked at very closely, whether the benefits outweighed, the risks outweighed the benefits. What we also learned though, is that the onset of the side effects was anywhere between 41 to, as you can see, um, 600, so somewhere around 638 days, somewhere around the, the under the year mark, so 209.5 days. So now we had some more information as to when to expect these side effects. But because uh, certainly we got our act together by the time Destiny Breast 03 rolled around, uh, we now know that when the trial was done in, in comparison with, with TDM1, there were side effects, but because we were much more vigilant, there were no grade five side effects. There were, there were a significant amount of ELILDs, uh, right now, it's about 15.2%, but they were not uh, significant enough to, you know, to put patients off the trial or cause severe toxicity. So the vast majority, as you can see, were more earlier stage. And this is because we were finding them earlier and fixing them earlier. So managing side effects is the key. Great drug, but we need to use aggressive anti-nausea medications. We really need to monitor closely for ILD. And this is where it's really a partnership between the oncologist and the patient. Patients have to be very vigilant for symptoms of cough or shortness of breath, which is one of the hallmarks of ILD. But on the, even before that happens, even grade one can be picked up with early CAT scans. So some of you might have your oncologist ordering more frequent lung scans now. And it's not just to monitor the disease, it's really to monitor for this ILD, which can be seen in, even subclinically. And then we can take action, stop the drugs, start steroids, and then uh, start with the lower dose. Our pulmonary colleagues are also very helpful here. So there's a growing sense of how we need to monitor uh, for this wonderful drug. Uh, so where we are now has really, uh, the, the flip as you can see is that we have a new standard for second line therapy. Uh, we now have TDXD, which is uh, taken that place. And we do have these other drugs that can still be used in the third line and beyond. 
there is a special place for her to climb uh, for patients who would prefer an oral regimen, for some reason cannot, you know, uh, have underlying lung disease already. We know that the tocatinib, the her to climb regimen did penetrate the brain. And so this exact, this drug combination is certainly an option to be used for patients as well. So looking forward, uh, where do we go from here? So clearly now that we have the second line indication, we're looking for the first line indication. So this is an ongoing trial that DB09 that's comparing the TDXD with pertuzumab versus the traditional Cleopatra regimen. Uh, there is another drug called neratinib, another oral drug in combination with Ketsyla, which was found to have brain activity in patients who had already progressed. And this is an important, again, uh, remains an important area. Where we are with trials at NYU, we have a Destiny 07, which is using TDXD in combination with various other drugs, both in the front and first line and the second line. And then a new ADC called ARX788, which will also be, which is also open um, at NYU. So the quest for the perfect ADC still continues. Um, moving quickly to the early stage scenario, we know that even very small HER2 cancers have a slightly worse prognosis uh, without treatment compared to stage for stage the HER2 negative. And this is a series from uh, MD Anderson and, and looking at other registries, which shows that if you were HER2 positive and you had the same stage, very small cancers, T1A which is or T1B, which is really cancers that are under a one centimeter or up to one centimeter, uh, if you were HER2 negative, the five-year relapse-free survival was 94, but if that same size of tumor, it was HER2 positive, it kind of went down to 77, and that theme was repeated with various registries. Uh, but the question is, is it just the HER2 that's driving this, or do we need chemo? And so we have two de-escalation trials that uh, have been updated this San Antonio, where less chemotherapy was used to treat these small HER2 cancers. So the first is the APT trial, a single arm phase two trial, uh, where you can see that the population that they used was really patients who had really small HER2 cancers. And so these patients were given a combination of a single drug Taxol in combination with trastuzumab instead of the traditional double agent chemotherapy with trastuzumab and pertuzumab that we use for our higher stages of cancer. And even after 10 years, as you can see, and I'm going to highlight the yellow parts here, the 10-year invasive disease-free survival was in the 90-plus range. And same thing with the relapse-free interval. So patients it had very, very few uh, relapses. Uh, what was a little bit of a caution is that there were some relapses. While there were only about six of them, uh, some of them happened after the five-year point where uh, usually we don't expect recurrences. So there was a small population of patients who relapsed late, and that's something that uh, bears further uh, assessment, especially in the next set of clinical trials. The other one was the ATTEMPT trial, uh, building on this idea of doing less chemo. This one pitted the APT regimen uh, versus an ADC. So in this case, it was TDM1 or Ketsyla, again, looking at very small uh, uh, cancers. And what they found is that the five-year update, there were only about three recurrences in this entire trial uh, in the patients who got TDM1. So it was kind of similar. TDM1 is still not approved in this setting because there were some more toxicities and it didn't meet the endpoint. Uh, but there is an ongoing trial using this idea again at NYU where we're using less TDM1, six instead of a whole year. And so this is something that is definitely going to get more traction in the early stage setting. Um, so looking forward, again, excellent outcomes. We've seen that with APT and ATTEMPT. The late recurrences bear some uh, assessment. So how do we identify who needs more or less? Just like you've heard of Oncotype DX, uh, there, was a, there is a, a genomic and uh, score that combines both clinical and genomic data, and it's called the HER2DX, not ready for prime time yet, but there will definitely be more to come in future studies. Uh, this uh, assay was applied on the APT and attempt and seemed to validate or seemed to identify patients who did well versus those who had earlier recurrences, or, and, and in some cases, late recurrences. So where we are at NYU is we have the ATTEMPT 2.0, as I mentioned. This study looks at six cycles of TDM1 followed by trastuzumab in comparison with the APT regimen. We have something called the ADEPT trial, which is looking at a completely non-chemo regimen for patients with the triple positive, those who are estrogen positive and HER2 positive, where we're just using endocrine therapy in combination with trastuzumab. And this is coming from Dana-Farber and we have it open uh, at NYU. And then we have some neoadjuvant trials that we're doing with patients, before patients go to surgery, where we're using less chemotherapy, the so-called COMPASS HER2 trial. 
Uh, and then for patients who do have residual disease after surgery, there is a trial looking at the standard, which is TDM1, or from, compared to TDM1 in combination with tocatinib. So as you can see, a lot of permutations and combinations, but the goal really is to try to minimize chemotherapy as much as possible. So in summary, HER2 cancer is more aggressive, but even so, even smaller tumors benefit from therapy. In the metastatic setting, brain mess is an unmet need, but dramatic improvements in outcome have been seen in 2002. Uh, and ADCs might ultimately replace chemotherapy. In the next few years, we may be talking really about moving up not just TDXT, but other ADCs and improve outcomes, not just in metastatic cancer, but also for early stage HER2 positive cancer. With that, I think I'm done and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much. There were, there are no open questions right now, but if um, participants can still type them in and we can answer them as they come in. Our next speaker is Dr. Sylvia Adams. Sylvia, I could see your screen. Great, wonderful. Um, just for the audience, uh, thanks for sticking with us. Um, it is now um, 7.07 .07 and uh, our meeting goes until 7.30. Uh, we have two talks. I will cover triple negative breast cancer and Dr. Chen will talk about hormone um, receptor positive um, tumors. Um, as you know, breast cancer is the uh, most common cancer in women and we have an excellent breast cancer center here at NYU with fantastic surgeons, multidisciplinary, uh, teams, et cetera. So um, please, you know, feel free to reach out for any um, needs in breast cancer. So we will cover the triple negative um, disease ones. Um, in general, you may know that this is the most aggressive subtype of uh, breast cancers. It is usually seen in 15% of women, uh, typically younger ages, um, and also a higher prevalence in women who are African-American and Hispanic. And it's also more frequent in familial breast cancers due to the um, BRCA gene. Typically, it also has the worst prognosis with quite high recurrence rates and um, short survival once uh, metastatic disease um, is present. So in my talk, I will cover two drugs that were uh, FDA approved in 2022. And then I will give you just an overview of um, some newer agents that actually were presented at San Antonio. And um, so the first two medicines we will talk about, uh, one are oral PARP inhibitors for early triple negative disease. And then afterwards, the, the drug that Dr. Uh, Diabrio mentioned and HER2 for advanced triple negative breast cancer that is HER2 low. So briefly on how do the BRCA mutated cancers respond to drugs such as the PARP inhibitors? And as you can see here in the upper schema, a uh, breast that, or any cell that um, is undergoing some damage to the DNA, uh, be it from chemotherapy or radiation, can be typically that, that gene damage can be repaired by, uh, by the, the cell itself, even if there is inhibition of, of some of those mechanisms. But after a PARP inhibitor is given, this is the oral medicine we talked about, the um, gene damage becomes more severe, goes from single strand breaks to double stranded breaks. And a typical cell with a normal BRCA protein can repair all this damage. Um, however, a cell that is BRCA mutated can no longer repair this damage and therefore these abnormal cells become cancerous. So uh, that is basically the, um, um, the rationale of using PARP inhibitors that in a um, cancer cell that is deficient for BRCA gene and is using PARP inhibitors, those cells uh, die. Um, and the FDA approval for this medication um, is, is uh, based on this trial, Olympia trial, that um, randomized women and men to the oral PARP or Laparib uh, given for one year versus a placebo pill. And in this study, the triple negative patients that were included, which was the majority, were called high risk and were eligible for the study if they had the initial cancer size either two centimeters or greater or lymph node positive tumors, or if they had their chemo 
chemotherapy before surgery, but they still had residual disease. So those women were eligible. And as you can see, the majority is a BRCA1 carrier um, and uh, only about a quarter of patients in the study were BRCA2 carriers. And as expected, the biggest majority is triple negative breast cancers with 80% in the study. And very excitingly, there was an improvement in the, uh, or lowering of the recurrence risk for these patients at three years, 36 months, you can see here, there is an uh, almost 9% difference in reduction of the recurrences and survival benefit was seen at that same time uh, of about 4%. Importantly for the triple negative subgroup, as you can see here, that bar is in the um, subgroup of patients who benefited from, from this treatment. So we actually, um, this is side effect profile, we watch out for anemia, but in general on this study compared to the placebo pill that patients took, there was no difference in the quality of life for patients. So in March of um, last year, this drug was approved by the FDA. Uh, Lynn Parza for treatment after surgery for early triple negative breast cancer and other tumors too that were related to a BRCA mutation. If those patients had high risk disease, as we discussed, and uh, patients had to have testing for the germline uh, BRCA mutation. So the second uh, drug that got approved last year is NHER2, and, and Dr. Diabrio uh, very elegantly described the antibody drug conjugate, so this is the smart bomb that takes chemotherapy drugs directly to the tumor cell. And in triple negative breast cancer, there are about 36% of patients who have this HER2 low situation. And actually in the chat, there was a question that somebody had an immunostochemistry assay for HER2 that required a fish on the reflex and since that fish reflex was negative, it is very likely that this patient has HER2 low cancer. So um, in this study, this was um, a very important study and actually um, it gave new uh, treatment options for many, many women. In this study, um, women were randomized to the NHER2, TDXD, versus what the physician and the, doc, uh, the, physician and the patient decided on next line of chemotherapy. This is metastatic patients who've had at least um, one or two prior lines of chemotherapy for their disease. And you can see here in, um, in this um, box, 60 uh, women were uh, triple negative. The others were her, her too low, but hormone positive. So in this group of 60 women with triple negative tumors that had some HER2 expression, or well, albeit low, there was a strong benefit over the current standard that we have in using in HER2. So this really changed our practice, right? Um, as you can see, progression freedom, progression free survival means that a woman is stable on the current therapy, does not need to switch therapy and is alive. And you can see that it doubled almost the time from our standard, which is, which is quite um, amazing. And then in terms of survival, it also more than doubled the survival rate compared to any chemo that we had before. So this is really um, a very new and important finding. And we were very excited to, um, um, to be part of that study and to participate in it. So in August, this um, study, um, the uh, DESTINY4 study led to the approval of NHER2. And this is not only for triple negative, but it's also for some of the ER positive tumors. However, they had to be her, her too low breast cancers. So very exciting because it's a survival benefit um, in these patients. So in one slide, um, because I think Dr. Chen has a very large um, uh, presentation also, um, there were newer strategies. They're not FDA approved, they're all in development such as intratumoral chemotherapy. Newer agents uh, tested in an ISPY trial um, and many other novel immune therapies um, and, uh, and, and so on were seen. So hopefully those will all go into later uh, clinical trials to be FDA approved. One interesting thing is um, black women have a higher incidence of triple negative breast cancer than white women. And they usually have worse outcomes, 
But one important study, and we actually in our group are working on looking at the immune infiltrates in the tumors of patients, here we show, or it was seen that black patients have a stronger immune infiltrate in their tumors, and they benefited more from immunotherapy than the white counterparts. They had a higher survival and, and higher response to chemo plus immune therapy in early triple negative breast cancer. So this is very exciting. And NYU will, be, um, will um, hopefully make a major impact in this field as well. So in summary, um, we have a new drug um, for patients who have high risk uh, triple negative breast cancer that is early and it's uh, BRCA uh, mutant patients. So it's important to get tested for, for genetics um, when patients are diagnosed with breast cancer. Number two, we have a new antibody drug conjugate for a lot of the triple negative breast cancer patients now in the metastatic setting, which is known to improve survival. So it's important to know the HER2 results from the last biopsy or any biopsy prior. And then the trials at NYU, um, we have multiple um, studies. Dr. Chen leads the neoadjuvant um, ISPY2 trial, which is amazing because you'll get new combinations um, coming out in real time on clinical trials. For the first line metastatic triple negative um, patients, we have a novel immune checkpoint inhibitor that, um, that attacks the um, macrophages in the tumor. And also we have study with saxituzumab, which is another antibody drug conjugate. And in the metastatic setting for triple negative disease, after two lines of therapy, so in the third line setting and even eighth line setting, we have multiple protocols with um, novel agents. So I'll finish here. And um, I, uh, I'm looking at that one question. And uh, in the meantime, Dr. Chen can pull up her, uh, her slides. Thank you. Um, if the mother has breast cancer, what's the percentage of her daughter, daughters being diagnosed with breast cancer? It's probably very low. Um, however, you need to get, the patient needs to get tested first with um, genetics. If the mom has a mutation, it's 50-50 chance that the daughters have the mutation. So they should get tested. If the mom had breast cancer that is related to a BRCA gene and the, the daughter doesn't carry BRCA, then you really don't have to worry much. However, if the patient has no, if the mom has no genetic mutation, then I think we still screen the um, daughter and start testing for myth mammograms, et cetera, about 10 years prior to the mom's, um, to the mom's diagnosis. Thank you. Great, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for sticking with us. There were a lot of in really important updates. So I will talk about hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer update from San Antonio. These, this is my disclosure. So a brief outline. Um, I will um, go over what is hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer briefly. I will talk about the Serena 2 study. Um, in finding a better partner in oral SIRDS. We'll talk about the right choice study involving a CDK4-6 inhibitor in highly aggressive tumor in the metastatic setting, and also updates, important updates from Taylor X with 12-year follow-up. And lastly, if we have time, um, I'll cover briefly a neoadjuvant study utilizing trastuzumab deroxtecan or in HER2. So hormone-positive breast cancer um, that are HER2 negative encompasses about 68% of all breast cancer diagnoses. I um, put red arrows on the hormone positive breast cancer cases. So it is still the most common type of breast cancer across race and ethnicity. We diagnose um, hormone positive breast cancer by immunohistochemistry. And so what is the estrogen receptor? It actually can act as a transcription factor. So when the estrogen binds to the um, cellular um, aspect of the estrogen receptor, it can actually mediate transcription factors or act as a transcription factor itself to promote growth and division of the cell. So in our search for a better endocrine therapy partner, we want to talk about the oral surge. These are oral formulation of a highly potent class of drugs. We already have an FDA-approved um, oral CERD. It's known as fulvestrin or Fazlodex. And the challenge is that it's given intramuscularly. So it can cause 
painful injection site, and patients do have to have frequent clinic visits. So last year, we actually had the first um, oral surge that demonstrated superiority in the metastatic setting. Patients had received one or two lines of prior therapy in the metastatic setting and were randomized to either elestestrin or investigator's um, choice of a hormone therapy. And majority of these patients had um, visceral metastases, so um, metastatic disease in a um, vital organ. And all of these patients had prior CDK4-6 inhibitors. So this drug actually demonstrated a 30% reduction in risk of progression or death. And in patients with a specific mutation in the um, estrogen receptor gene, the, there was a 45% reduction in risk of progression or death. And the update from this year actually looked at duration of CD prior CDK4-6 inhibitor. And you can see that in the green um, survival curve are those patients who received elicestrant regardless of how long they were previously on CDK4-6 inhibitor, they benefited. Um, so quickly moving to side effects, why do we need a better, a, a new class of drugs? The, the challenge with aromatase inhibitors, as we know, is um, compliance. So it is really difficult for some patients to take the medication for a long term. So this class of drug actually does not cause a lot of joint aches the most common side effects is low-grade um, uh, nausea. And so it's much less joint aches, mild nausea, which are manageable. And so the elicestrin became the first drug that um, demonstrated superiority in the metastatic setting. At San Antonio this year, a second study was presented with a different um, oral cert, chemisestrin. In similar way, the patients were randomized to the um, fulvestrin, which is a standard endocrine therapy, versus two different doses of chemisestrin. A third dose was investigated, but um, discontinued. So this was the highest dose. So only 75 and 150 was reported. And, and you can see that about 30% of patients do have the mutation in the estrogen receptor. Um, and this study actually demonstrated in the low lower dose, 75 or 150 milligram, the there was a about a 40 to 30 to 40 percent reduction in risk of um, progression compared to the fulvestrin. So this now is a sec is the second drug um, of oral sir to demonstrate superiority, and in patients with lung or liver meds patients did um, benefit it from the oral CERD compared to the fulvestrin. And looking, this is a really important slide. So detecting the ESR1 mutation through a blood test, CTDNA, the, the drug at both doses were demonstrated to be able to reduce the level of the mutated, um, of the ESR1 mutation by cell-free DNA. And fulvestrin did also, but not to the same degree compared to the two drugs. So this um, demonstrates that there's on-target effect of the potency of the drug. And the drug was um, relatively well tolerated. Um, again, much less um, joint A compared to the aromatase inhibitors. So again, we now have two drugs that have demonstrated superiority in the metastatic setting. And these drugs are being studied in the early stage breast cancer as well. We actually do have um, a oral CERD, um, a oral CERD study that is open and accruing in higher risk patients who completed surgery. And now, um, even though we've been utilizing CDK4-6 inhibitors since its FDA approval and we at NYU have been utilizing for even longer through clinical trials prior, prior to the FDA approval, um, I do want to um, show this study, which, which is called the Right Choice Study. And this, this, this study actually utilized ribocyclob, one of the three uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors that are FDA approved. This study is actually... Um, enrolled patients with aggressive disease, life-threatening um, visceral crises, highly symptomatic disease. And these patients often get chemotherapy first, but there's never been a study that um, 
randomized patients to CDK4-6 inhibitor with oral, um, with oral endocrine therapy versus combination chemotherapy. And so this is called the right choice study. Again, one-to-one -one randomization to ribocyclib plus an endocrine therapy versus a physician choice of combination, so two-drug chemotherapy regimen. And these are the baseline characteristics of the study. And as you can see, focus on here, the median progression-free survival in patients who receive ribocyclib plus endocrine therapy was about two years versus combination chemotherapy, only about one year. So the benefit was doubled. The, this was really a great study that um, answered this question that previously was unanswered. And looking at what we call a forest pot, plot, you can see the majority of the cases, um, regardless of whether visceral crises was present, liver metastases were present, age, um, that overall the, the treatment fa favored the ribocyclic plus endocrine therapy. So I will skip these um, slides for the interest of time, but this again was a really important study that even in patients who have highly aggressive symptomatic disease, the right, the oftentimes the, the knee-jerk reaction is to jump to chemotherapy, but in fact, ribocyclib or CDK4-6 inhibitor may be the right choice and the better choice for these patients. Now, moving to updates in early stage breast cancer, it was not too long ago, just 20 years ago, we were um, giving patients chemotherapy if they had a tumor greater than one centimeter. But genomic assays, such as the oncotype, which we had several questions about oncotype, uh, high, um, significantly impacted the treatment of early stage, low genomic risk ER positive breast cancer. We know that a low risk score patient do not benefit from chemotherapy and patients with high risk score do benefit from chemotherapy. But for a long time, we did not know what about the intermediate range score. So the Taylor X study was first reported in 2018 and this is a 12 year follow-up. And it's important to follow these patients for a long term to, to ensure that it really is safe in the long term for patients to omit chemotherapy. So again, um, the purpose of this study is to ask, can most patients with intermediate oncotype scores safely avoid chemotherapy? This is the 12-year update. You can see that the survival curves of patients who receive chemotherapy versus those who don't are superimposed. So endocrine therapy was non-inferior to chemotherapy followed by endocrine therapy. So patients with low or intermediate scores can feel, feel relatively safe that um, not having received chemotherapy um, was not a disadvantage. The study also focused on patients who were younger, less than 50. So for, for the majority of cases, low oncotype score, 11 to 15, there was no chemotherapy benefit. There was marginal benefit if your score um, fell in the 16 to 20 range. And there was, there was definitely evidence of um, benefit if your score fell between 21 and 25. And you can see that um, when we break down the age, age groups by five years, the, the curve actually swayed to chemotherapy being better in the younger patient population. And lastly, um, I think we just have just a few seconds to focus on the HER2 low patient population in the metastatic setting, specifically hormone positive breast cancer patients with HER2 low tumors in Destiny 04 demonstrated a 50% reduction in risk of progression and 35% reduction in risk of death. And um, Dr. Diabro actually went through the um, mechanism of action of these drugs. So I won't go through this, but the drug actually is being studied in the neoadjuvant early stage breast cancer setting. So this study actually randomized patients to either the TDXD versus endocrine therapy plus TDXD. So this is strictly in hormone positive HER2 low breast cancer patients. And majority, so actually half of the patients were um, node positive. Majority of patients were 
one plus, um, some were two plus. Um, and so looking at the objective response rate, and you could see the majority of patients had a response or stable disease, which is what we expect from either chemotherapy or hormonal therapy prior to surgery in stage two, stage three breast cancer. What's interesting about this study is that patients who received TDXD, they received it in both arms, but about 49% had a change in their HER2 IHC status after treatment. And so majority of these patients with change in status um, became her, uh, IHC zero. And so last thing I want to point out is that one patient did develop a grade two pneumonitis. So although this was a small patient population, about 60 patients, um, one of these patients did develop pneumonitis. So we do have to um, keep this in mind as, as this drug moves into early stage breast cancer. And with that, I will finish and happy to take any additional questions. Thank you, Dr. Chan. I think there is one question in the... Can you see it? Yes. So okay. the question was, was there data presented on the ER PR positive note node positive early stage breast cancer with a abemocyclib. So that's the Monarch EAT study, the update um, with now three years of follow-up continue to show that there's benefit in terms of invasive disease-free survival in patients with ER positive breast cancer um, and node positive disease, either high biologic risk, so KS, by KS67 greater than 20%, or high, um, high clinical stage. So those are um, larger tumors and, uh, nodal and positive nodal status. So abemocyclib continue to demonstrate superiority um, versus standard endocrine therapy alone. Thank you. I think one more question came in. How often is the test for genetic mutations updated? How often should I check for changes in status from an undetermined gene in a deleterious, to a deleterious status? So that's a good question. Um, the, we began to test a wider panel of genes um, starting around 2015, 2016. So for my patients who had genetic testing before that time, I actually do suggest that they meet with a genetic counselor to see, to review their original panel and then to determine whether they need to be tested for an expanded panel. And it's always better to meet with a genetic counselor to, to have these discussions um, instead of just sending off um, a panel that um, without some personalization. So I, and, and then with regards to uh, the VUSs, so undetermined um, significance, majority of times these VUSs um, are not deleterious. But in rare cases, they do, um, they can transform to a deleterious status. And that's because we don't know everything um, that, 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 that needs to be known about the genetic predispositions um, of the genes that we know, um, we, that we've sequenced so far. So when the status change, you actually will be contacted because the, the data um, is, is on file that you've had this VUS and that the, um, we would reach out to you um, if, if the status changes. Thank you. I think we've answered all of our questions. And in the interest of time, this is going to conclude our program. I'd like to thank everyone who signed on to listen. And I'd also like to thank all of our presenters for taking time out and sharing all of this information. And I look forward to more community outreach programs in the upcoming year. Thank you very much. Thank you.